Hi guys, it's Mrs. Cameron here, back from our holiday weekend. And we are continuing our ACT practice so that we can get ready for our ACT school day test um, tomorrow. So taking the ACT at school tomorrow, right? You get uh, triple time versus when you're taking it on the Saturday. However, the ACT school day uh, it is not college reportable. You're only using this towards your graduation requirement. So from our packet in class, we're moving on to question number 11, which says, which of the following is the product of the difference of 3x squared and 1 and the difference of x squared and 4? Um, there's two ways you can go about solving this. You could just um, use your area model to solve this. Area is base times height, and we've got binomials, 3x squared, and a negative 1 when we break it up, and x squared, and a negative 4. And now for our area model, we're going to multiply our base times um, width or length times height, however you want to call it. So 3x squared times 1x squared is going to be 3x to the power of 4. And then x squared times 1 negative x squared or negative 1x squared, however you want to call it. And then 3x squared times negative 4, positive times a negative, negative 12x squared. And last, negative 1 times negative 4, negative times a negative times positive 4. And I can see they've all got the 3x to the power of 4, so that doesn't help us much. And we can eliminate b because it doesn't have the plus 4 on the end. And now we need to look at our, our, our middle term here, our x squared. We have negative 12x squared plus a negative x squared. And again, we said our, our invisible number here is a 1. So negative 12 plus negative 1 will be negative 13x squared. And that's one way to multiply your um, your binomials is by using your area model. And now I had some students in class say, Mrs. Cameron, I'm still really, you know, not comfortable doing that. So um, we decided to use our graphing calculator features to um, also solve this problem. Even though it doesn't look anything like a, a graphing type of question, you can use a graphing uh, calculator because it's allowed on the ACT to solve it. So we're going to put in the question exactly how it is right here. Right here into our y equals on the calculator. So parentheses 3x squared minus 1 x squared minus 4 and we'll get a graph for this. Then to find our answer, we need to look at our answer choices and see which one has a graph that matches. So I'm going to come down to my y2. I'm going to try a 3x to the power of 4 plus 13x squared plus 4 graph. And you can see on this calculator, because it's the color edition, that the two graphs do not match. My um, equation from the question is blue, and my equation from the answer is red, and they're not the same graph. So I'm going to come back over here. And I would, again, I would skip B, because C looks a lot closer to A. And the only thing you have to change to check it is that plus sign to a minus and then when you graph it you can see very easily on the color edition calculator that C is a match and we already knew that was the answer by doing the area model 
And when you're using the non-color edition of your TI-84 uh, graphing calculator, you can go into the table here, second graph, that gives you your table, and you can see that for every value of X, graph of Y1 and Y2, every number is exactly equal. So we know uh, by, what is this? Like three different ways that C is definitely our answer to question number 11. And now I'm gonna second quit to get out of my graph and move on to question number 12. It says, in the standard XY coordinate plane, if a square has vertices at negative two, negative three, two, negative three, and two, one, what is the set of coordinates for the final vertex? And we just looked at this question actually in my seventh period. Right at the end of the day, we were doing these questions. So what, what we decided was easiest here is to first draw your coordinate plane with your X and Y. And look, even in the question, they're giving you the order of the, um, the numbers. X comes before Y. And now we're going to... Um, graph our vertices of our square. So one vertice is at negative two, negative three. So X is negative two, Y is negative three. That's about here. Our next one is at two, negative three. So X is positive two, Y is negative three. The third one is at two, one. X is positive two, Y is one. And now you can see very easily if we were turning this shape into a square, we've got three sides of the square. The fourth side of your square would be right here. And what's the coordinate for this? X is, Y is, X is negative two, Y is positive one, which is answer choice K. And then moving on to question number 13, uh, it says reduce this mess of a polynomial to its simplest terms. In order to do that, um, this looks like a great big fraction, right? So I'm gonna draw my fraction bar. And we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial or a monomial divided by a monomial, however you wanna call it. Okay, we have on the top, x to the power of eight, y to the power of 12, no z, but on the bottom, we have x to the power of 4, y to the power of 3, z squared. And right away, when I'm looking at this question, I'm asking myself, every fraction is a what type of problem? Every fraction is a division problem. So when we're dividing our monomial, polynomials, whatever, however you want to call them, when we're dividing, and these x's, it's the same base, what happens to the exponents? What does that mean? x to the power of 8 divided by x to the power of 4, right? You see how I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm breaking it up in my mind, so I'm only looking at the same letter at the same time. I'm going to chunk it down. Um x to the power of a divided by x to the power of 4. What's the exponent rule there? If you're not sure, think about what does x to the power of 8 divided by x to the power of 4 mean? x to the power of 8 means x times itself 8 times. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 divided by x to the power of 4 means x times itself four times. And now 
I'm going to go to a new color. Each one of these, what's x divided by x? Same number divided by same number is a great big 1. That cancels to 1. That cancels to 1. That cancels to 1. That cancels to 1. What are we left with? x to the power of x to the power of 4. So our rule is when we're dividing these, right, and they have the same base, what happens to the exponent? When you're moving the bottom to the top, you subtract the exponent. So x to the power of 8 minus 4 is going to be x to the power of 4, which we see here and here. So right away, we get to cross some stuff off. And we're going to do the same thing with the y. y to the power of 12 minus 3 is y to the power of 9. They're both still in. And now, z squared. Well, c, answer choice c, doesn't have a fraction left. Um, but is, is the rule that you're just allowed to move whatever's left at the bottom to the top? No, because you'd have an invisible z to the power of 0 minus 2. That'd be z to the power of negative 2. So that's wrong. Only answer choice B is correct. And then question number 14 says, which of the following is a value of n that satisfies log base n of 64 equals 2. If you remember your rules for, for log, then you know that what this um, is asking you is what number to the power of 2 equals to 64? What number squared equals 64? What number times itself equals 64? Well, you might already have the answer, and you might remember your rules for log if you had an Algebra 2 class where you practiced that. Um, if not, if you haven't taken Algebra 2, then um, this was not covered in um, Algebra 1 and Geometry. So you can use your um, TI-84 or TI-83 calculator to hit the math button and say, ooh, I want to find something that's a log. Because I'm looking on the calculator, I, don't, I see a log here. But when I press this, there's no way for me to use my arrows to go in between the parentheses and the log to put something down there in the basement at the bottom. So that's not the log I'm using. I'm going to hit math, and I'm going to arrow down. And I'm looking in my math menu for anything else that has to do with log. And we see this log base. So I'm going to select it here by pressing enter on it. And there it is. I've got my little cursor blinking in the basement just like what I want. And we're going to give it a try. Let's try answer choice F. Log base 4 of 64 equals... 3, not 2, so not the answer. Trying the next one. There's an, actually another way you can get to this menu. You can hit math and scroll, or you can hit alpha window or alpha F2, and you have another way to get to the log base. Oops. Right here, enter on it, log base. This time we'll try the 6 of 64 and we're getting closer to 2 but not exactly 2 so answer choice G is not correct and then one more time log base 8 of 64 of course that does equal to 2 because 8 to the power of 2 equals to 64 8 squared equals 64. Now we can continue on to the next page. Question number 15. 
says, a survey is conducted among 700 high school students to see who their favorite college basketball teams are. If 250 students like the Hawks, 200 students like the Vikings, 50 students like the Bears, and the remaining students like the Warriors, approximately what percentage of the 700 high school students answered that the Warriors were their favorite team, round to the nearest tenth of a percentage point? So I'm going to look up here, and our question is, what percentage have the Warriors as their favorite? So we want to find out how many students have the Warriors as their favorite and compare it to what? We want to compare it to the total students. And we can see from the question that there are 700 students of the 700 students. So that's our total students. Oops. Our total students is 700. And now we need to find out how many of those students have the Warriors as their favorites. And it says, the remaining students like the Warriors. So there were 700 students to begin with. And 250 like the Hawks, 200 like the Vikings, 50 like the Bears. So whatever's left are the remaining students. That's who likes the Warriors. So I'm going to put this in the calculator just like this as a big old, big old one problem. I don't have to put multiple things in. I'm going to put in my fraction by going alpha y equals and a regular fraction is option one. And on the numerator on the top, I'm going to type in my 700 minus 250 minus 200 and minus another 50 over my denominator, 700, enter is 2 sevenths, which I don't want my answer to be a fraction, I want my answer to be a decimal, so I'm gonna hit math, and I'm gonna turn my answer into a decimal by choosing option two. That little arrow means turn the answer into des decimal. And then hit enter again, and we're almost there, right? Um, when we're converting a decimal into a percentage, we just have to multiply our answer times 100. And now we've got it. And we can see for sure that the closest number to our calculator answer here is option B. You got it. And I'm going to continue on to question number 16, which says, if x squared equals 36 and y squared equals 81, which of the following cannot be the value of x plus y? So when we're looking at this, right, because our variable is squared, each x and y, each of our variables is going to have two answers. So x could be this or x could be that. y could be this or y could be that. And what number squared equals to 36? If you're not sure, you can use your calculator. 
What's the opposite of something squared? Look on the squared button, it gives you a hint. It's square root. So your square root of 36 is six. So we know that x could be equal to six, and we also know that x could be equal to negative six, you got it. Then our y's, y, if y is squared equals 81, then y equals, find the square root of 81, nine, or you got it, negative nine. And now we have to say which of the following cannot be the value of x plus y. So we got to use these values for x, these values for y. Can we make a negative 15 out of an x and a y? Yes, negative 6 plus negative 9, x plus y. Can we make negative 3? Yes, 6 plus negative 9. Can we make a zero? No, because I'm not allowed to say six plus negative six or nine plus negative nine. That would be x plus x or y plus y. That's impossible. That's our answer. You can make a three by saying negative six plus nine. You can make a 15 by saying six plus nine. So all the others were possible. Number 16 was not. And we can continue on to question number 17, which says, a system of linear equations is shown below. Which of the following describes the graph of this system of linear equations in the standard xy coordinate plane? Well, how about we graph them to find out? I'm gonna go to my y equals, clear out whatever old stuff is in here. And in order for me to put this on the TI-84 calculator, I have to have my Y only by itself. And it's got a 4 with it. In order to cancel out that 4, cancel it to uh, an invisible sneaky ninja 1. What's the 4 and the Y doing together? Multiplying. How do we get rid of multiplication? How do we cancel it out? Through division. So I need to divide both sides of my equation at the top by 4. Divide by 4, that's the sneaky ninja 1. And I'm going to divide this by 4. But I don't have to divide it. I can just leave it looking like that and put it in the calculator. 3x plus 12 divided by 4. And then the same thing for my other equation. I want to get the y by itself, so I've got to do what with the negative 4? Divide by it. Divide that by negative 4. Sneaky ninja 1. Divide this side of the equal sign by a negative 4. And we've kept it equivalent. And now we can type it in. y equals negative 3x minus 8 divided by negative 4. Click graph. And we can see our two lines. And they are two parallel lines. They're not a single line. They're not perpendicular. Remember, perpendicular lines would be at an intersection of 90 degrees. So they're not perpendicular. They are parallel. And the slope of my lines, the bunny is hopping up the mountain, so it's a positive slope. Our correct answer is B. And then we can continue moving on through to the remainder of the page. Question number 18, that can hop right into the calculator since we're talking about bunnies. Question number 18, you have negative six over something negative three. What are those up and down bars called that's around the negative three? What are those lines? Those are your absolute value. Take a look on the calculator. Do you see anything that looks or sounds like absolute value? No, me either. So we're gonna go to our math options. And if you look under the first section here, we're looking for anything that looks or sounds like absolute value, nothing there. But when we scoot over, 
abs. No, our calculator did not magically grow abs. That is for absolute value. So we have, a, we have an option for that. So in order to put number 18 on my calculator, I'm going to first put in a fraction. Option one, plain fraction with a negative six for my numerator and my denominator. I'm gonna hit that math. Find my absolute value option of negative three and hit enter. There's the answer. And of course, if you didn't want to use the calculator for that, you could always just say, okay, negative six over what is the absolute value of negative three? It's just asking how far away is negative three from zero? Is three away? A, uh, a negative divided by a positive is a negative and six divided by three is two. That would have been fast on the calculator or fast by hand. Question number 19 says, what are the values for A that satisfy the equation A plus Y times A plus Z equals zero? Well, in order to make this whole thing here equal to zero, in order to make this, oops, this equal to zero, we need either piece, either factor to be equal to zero. So we need a plus y to be equal to zero, or we need a plus z to be equal to zero. And there's a few ways you could go about solving this. You could subtract um, y from both sides here. You could, so could subtract z from both sides here. You'd have the answer. Or you can just say, how, what, if, what, if, what, what if a was a number? 5 plus what equals 0? It'd be negative 5. That'd be negative y. And same thing over here. Say that a was 15. We're just making up a number. 15 plus what equals 0? It'd be negative 15. That'd be negative z. So our, our answer is right here at option A. We would want the opposite. I might have done that a little bit backwards. That's okay. Either way, we needed the opposite of, of y. We needed the opposite of z to give us a 0. Another way to go in, you could say a equals minus y on both sides, a equals negative y minus z on both sides, a equals zero minus z, negative z. There you go. Two ways to solve it. And then one more question for this video. Question number 20 says, in the circle shown below, c is the center and lies on segments AE and BF. Which of the following statements is not true? Well, let's look at answer choice F, angle BAC, measure 70 degrees. Line segment AB is parallel to line segment EF. Line segment AB is congruent to line segment BD. Angle BCE, BCE is congruent to angle DCF. And line segment CF is equivalent to line segment EF. Well, looking at those answer choices, just looking at the shapes, I see an obvious answer. It doesn't even say the shapes are not necessarily drawn to scale, which it might say, but I can see that this line, um, line segment CF from here to here is definitely longer than line segment EF right there. So I know that this is not true. I just know it. And sometimes you can eyeball these questions and it looks, oh, that's too obvious. That can't be the right answer. 
Well, sometimes the obvious answer just is the right answer. Sometimes you just got to go with your gut. Um, so we know that's the answer, but say it wasn't so obvious if you had to do some figuring. How do we prove that angle BAC is 70 degrees? Angle BAC is right here. Angle BAC. How do we know that it's 70 degrees? Well, if we look here, angle C is across from a 40 degree angle. So I'm going to write this. A, B, C. This triangle, I just plopped it over there. So if this angle C is across from a 40 degree angle, those are called vertical angles, and vertical angles are congruent. And if you look at line segment AC and line segment BC, they're both radius or radii of the circle, so they're obviously equivalent. And I know my three angles inside of my triangle have to add up to 180 degrees, so if we call this angle X and angle X, they gotta be equivalent. So 40 plus X plus X has to be equal to 180 degrees. Oh, that's a terrible plus. Sorry, here. 40 plus X plus X equals 180. Okay, so let's put that on the calculator. 40 and it says that angle A or X is 70 degrees plus 70 plus another 70. Yes, indeed, that does equal 180 degrees. Moving on, line segment AB is parallel to EF. Just look at it. AB to line segment EF. If those lines were to go on and on and on, forever and forever and forever, they certainly would uh, never ever touch. They are parallel. That is true. On these geometry questions, whether you're looking at circles, uh, triangles, parallel lines cut by a transversal, nine times out of ten, you're proving things that look the same or the same. You're proving things that look parallel or parallel. Yes, go with it. Um, answer choice H says that uh, line segment AB right here is congruent to line segment BD right here. And we know they both have this 40 degree angle, which means all of these angles are 70 degrees. We know that whatever these sides are, these long sides, they're all the same. So these two triangles are congruent. So the smallest side is also congruent. And we know that angle, oh, let me clear out everything. Answer choice J says, Angle B, C, E, so I'm going to follow, B, C, E, is equivalent to angle D, C, F. And here's how we know that's true. How do you know it's true? I know how I know it's true. They both have this something, whatever this something is, in this little unknown section, and they're both being added to 40 degrees. I don't know plus 40 is going to be the same as the same I don't know plus 40. So that's true. So answer, choice K, was the correct answer. I'm going to go ahead and cut this video off here, and I'm going to try to find some time to get uh, another video with the next 10 questions. I hope that this is helping you to, um, to study and I hope that you are successful in meeting your goal on your ACT, whatever that may be. If you would like to see any other types of um, 
ACT questions, please feel free to um, let me know by making a comment. My comments have been pretty blank, so I think I'd have time to read them if you write it or if you're one of my students. You can text me on Teams, and you know I'm very responsive. I'll do my best to get back to you there in a timely manner. Wishing you all the best, Mrs. Cameron. Bye.